Get started now if you'd like to, uh, if we could have your attention again. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome back. We're going to start this morning with some granola, a good way to start any morning. But this granola is great also for a snack, and it, and it can be something that you can keep it, even as an adult, can keep by your desk and uh, munch on throughout the day. This is good to send to kids. Uh, it, you can put it in a nice... Uh, um, sealed container and they can have it at school as well. I like just to make a lot of my food with cast iron. I think cast iron is something that is really underrated as far as cookware. It's, aside from the fact it's relatively affordable, um, once you use it more and more, it starts to what's called season, so it makes it so that it doesn't stick. And it's absolutely a wonderful um, way to conduct heat and not add any, certainly, aluminum into it as well. And it, and, um, it, it does its own nonstick. So we're going to start with this with some quinoa. Now these are the quinoa flakes, and they look a little bit like oatmeal. And I'm going to add a little bit of oil. If you are using, oh, this is really hot. If you, if you are using um, cast iron, you, you need very, very little oil. But I just put a little bit in here to give it a good toasty flavor. Now, we're going to give a disclaimer right now that cooking on cook on temperature things that we don't normally have is going to make it a little bit more challenging. But this is very, very quick. When you cook the quinoa, you don't want to, you want to be right there and just stir it just enough to toast it up a little bit. If you overcook quinoa, it'll get very bitter. bitter. And, and the other thing, you know, you, you understand that we're doing this here to show you how to do it. We don't have a kitchen, so we've, we've built our own little, where we have little electric heating elements. Yeah. that isn't see perfect. This, see how this goes. Now with the nuts, I use about, I have four different varieties in this one. I have almonds, hazelnuts, uh, pumpkin seeds, and uh, sunflower seeds. And if you are using the heartier nuts, you might want to start with the hearty nuts first and then move in the smaller nuts later. But I all have them chopped to about the same equal size so that they'll cook equally. All I'm really wanting to do here is I started with raw nuts. I just want to cook them until they're aromatic, just so that until you just start to smell them, not to a point where you're really baking them or, or take, taking too much out of them or getting them very much too much dry roasted. But this is just a, just a little bit. I'm going to just a little bit longer. I'm going to get that. I turned it down. Just, you did turn it down? You did. I did. Okay. All right. That's good. And then I'm going to add in the coconut. I'm not going to add flax into this one. Um, but when the coconut starts to turn brown, which it already has, let's take this off. Can I put hot things oh. on here? Yep. Okay. Now we're going to put the quinoa back in here and mix this all up. And then I'm going to add a little bit of salt. Okay. Now there's two ways you can do this. You can put the tapioca syrup or the rice syrup right in here on the pan, or you can dump it. Have it nicely mixed. Now, I like tapioca, tapioca syrup a lot. I think it's got a great flavor, but rice syrup also works very, very well for this. Agave, I have found, does not stick quite as much, so you have to be careful. It's too sticky. It gets, yeah, it gets, and same thing with honey. So I'm going to put it, and you'll see, and the same thing happens to rice syrup. When you heat it, it turns to a very, very nice liquid, so it makes it very easy to pour. And then that way you can have it mix much better. Now, if you use a lot of tapioca or rice syrup, then you're going to get more of a, thank you, i got to add the blueberries, dried fruit. If, if you add a lot, you're going to get a lot more of something that you can form so that you can make a bar. If you add a little bit, then it's going to make still a nice, like, loose granola, something that you would consider as a cereal. This is great. And then how you want to do it if you're going to make a bar, it, why don't we get rid of this so they can see better, is after it's all mixed, you just pretty much put it on the parchment paper, just like that, two, and then you just press it down with, with the parchment paper. As the syrup cools, it will harden more and then it will become a lot stiffer. So in time, 
it becomes nice and stiff. And I'll show you one that we made yesterday, which is nice and stiff. It's a nice little bar. It's the same ingredient, same things. So we're going to pass the samples. Yeah. Are, are volunteers in the room? We have no volunteers. We have, yeah, we do. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. And then we have that as well, too. So we'll put that on to you. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Now you can have fun with this. You can use all different types of nuts and seeds. You, you really, whatever is, are your particular favorites. Um, peanuts are not something that we really recommend to, to eat a lot amount of. Peanuts are actually legumes, they're not seeds. But with peanuts, um, you, they, are, they are very moldy for one. They are um, not as high in amino acids as a lot of the other nuts. They're not as digestible. If you, the, the moldy part is the biggest concern because of the fact you can see it on the shell. You can see that kind of mold that forms in there. It's because it, it grows and lives in the granite. It suns and it rainy and it's sunny and it's rainy and over time it'll start to mold. The tree nuts are going to be a lot better and um, what you definitely want to stay away from are nuts that are coated in things like um, the corn syrups or anything like that. Sweeteners. Sweeteners. I'm sorry? Roasted nuts. This is a recipe that we would recommend raw nuts and not roasted. You don't want anything that's salted or, or roasted or anything like that. Yes. Um, if you had something with nut, well, depending upon what allergies they were to, you could substitute with quinoa, sunflower, and pepita are, you, are seeds that many people actually can tolerate if they have a nut aller allergy, but, but that is... Um, this would not be a recipe for you if you couldn't do that. No. So while you're sampling that, we're going to get ready to make some kale. I'm going to pass out some cards. So if anybody has any questions for either the morning session or for any of the recipes, uh, just to make life uh, a little quicker and make sure we get through everything, feel free to write down your questions and we'll make sure we get to and them. And that'll be great because then we can answer questions while we're transitioning so that you're not having to sit here and just wait for us all the time. Save those questions for the end of the day. Yeah, but while we're transitioning, it'd be good to have. I don't want them. A couple of them we can answer. Which ones did we use? We used hazelnut, almond, walnut, and do we uh, pumpkin seeds? No, there were no, no. walnuts. No there walnuts. were pa pepitas and pumpkin seeds. Oh, yeah, you, actually, you know what? There are walnuts in there. five. There were five. There are walnuts. It's walnuts, hazelnuts, p almonds, pumpkin seeds, and sunflower seeds. Yes, and that's what's in the sample that you're all getting right now. Oh, good. Thanks. Oh, man, that smells good. Okay. Okay, the next thing that we're going to make is sautéed kale. And this is my very favorite breakfast food. The piece that we were talking about earlier about balancing your pH so many of us are very acidic. And if you, you have one of those kits where you test your urine in the morning, first thing when you get up, you notice that, that if you are really acidic or your child is really acidic, the best thing to do is to eat green for breakfast. Having a salad with breakfast would be an awesome way to start your day. And it, it's just something different that we need to think about adding the green to our diet. Kale, Betsy has totally introduced me to kale a few years ago, and it is my favorite food. My husband completely makes fun of me because I eat kale at least three times a week. How are you serving it today, Susan? So today, we're going to saute it. There are, kale comes in a lot of forms. This is kale. As a chef, I just want you to know, I used kale all the time as garnish. We eat it. It's much better for us than just looking at it. This particular form of kale is called dinosaur kale, and it is a flatter leaf. It's got the big rib in the back of it, but it also comes in curly kale, and it's 
You can get green or red, you know, red that really looks more purpley. Um, I like the dinosaur only because it's so easy to clean because all you have to do is pull off. You can just pull the green away from the, the rib. You could eat the rib. There's nothing the matter with this except for that it's tougher and it's going to have to take longer to cook and you want something that cooks up fast so that the kale is not overcooked. So, Can I just show real quickly, because we talked about last year, if you take these and you, and you put olive oil on both sides and you bake this, it will become crispy. So for, if you have a child that has texture sensitivities, just make sure you do exactly what Susan just did and remove the stem. And then you put olive oil on both sides, put it in about 325, put some salt on it, and they become a nice crispy cracker. Would you tear that up? Yeah. So this particular recipe for sauteed kale, it's good for breakfast, it's good for lunch, it's good for dinner anytime. I don't know that you'd want to add garlic to it for breakfast, but that's just a personal preference. Mm. I, I think that garlic Garlic's is good, good in everything. Anytime. So I'm going to put a little garlic in there, and I'm just going to let it soften just for a minute, and I'm going to add the kale. And the kale is going to cook down. This is, I think, two maybe three bunches that I'm putting together in here. And we just roughly, coarsely chopped it. Didn't have to uh, do anything special to it. Pulled off that stem and add some more when it cooks down. When I first started eating kale, this is what I did. I had kale with garlic. And, and I would add a little seasoning to it because I'm kind of, uh, my father was a chef as well. I grew up eating lots of seasoned foods. and. Because of that, I think that everything should have spices and seasons added to it. One of the things that I like adding to my kale is nutmeg. I usually add some fresh ground nutmeg at the end. And this is a nutmeg grinder. There's a lot of different kinds. It just holds the little nutmeg, which is, this is a whole nutmeg. Looks like a seed. And you can stick, you can use this kind or whatever you can find, I think, that Williams-Sonoma and the other kitchen stores have a variety of nutmeg grinders, kind of like a pepper mill, and then you just can freshly grate that. You could also use a microplane, micro plane like zester to, to do this, but there is nothing better than fresh grated nutmeg. It I makes agree. She, Susan introduced me to the world of nutmeg, and I've been using it on just about everything I can find these days. I, I kind of use nutmeg in place of pepper. Um, or in addition to pepper, because it just adds another dimension. It's good in sauces, it's good in a lot of different things. So this is going to take anywhere from three to five minutes to cook, depending on how high. I mean, if you wanted to fry this to get a real crisp texture, you would cook it faster under a higher heat. I'm going to cook it a little slower and let it cook down. After it cooks down, I'm going to add two ingredients to it. I'm going to add tomatoes, and I'm going to add some sweet potatoes. So. You know, it's Friday morning. You had sweet potatoes last night. You had some left over. You've got some tomatoes sitting on the counter. They're about to go. You throw them in. All of these things are ways to use up those ingredients that you already have and, and just add to a really delicious meal. The other thing you can do if you make some turkey bacon and you cook the turkey bacon in the pan, then you add the kale to that turkey bacon fat. So it gets that nice smoky flavor in there is another really good thing. If you're cooking turkey bacon, make sure and add a little bit of olive oil or grapeseed oil to the pan because it'll help crispen up, crispy up it. And then, it, then you'll infuse that oil with some of the great flavors and that will make it even better. You could use white potatoes. You don't have to. No. I think I'm going to not do that. Okay. Um, you could use white potatoes if you had some of those left over, but I'm, I'm choosing to use sweet potatoes just because they're, they're better for us to, to eat. They've got a lot of great antioxidants, and they look real pretty with the green, and my color coordination here is very important. It's, what she said earlier about the baked pota sweet potatoes is important. You should think about cooking in bulk. As Susan always says, cook once, eat twice. So if you're so. going to make sweet potatoes or any, anything that um, will sit nicely in your refrigerator, make sure and make a, a, a double batch. We always, every single dinner we have in my household, I'm always considering, I make sure I have a portion for my son's lunch for the next day so that he can have whatever we had for dinner the next day in his lunch. And I bought some really nice stainless steel thermoses and I can put 
whatever we had, I heat it up in the morning, put it in the thermos, and then he has it for lunch. Do you have a resource for those stainless steel thermoses? Um, I, I, I am the queen of Google, so I just Google everything. I, I use, I mean, the company Thermos actually makes some good ones. I'm sorry, what? Target. Yeah, Target has them, right. Yeah. So the sweet potatoes are already cooked. I just want to heat them up, and then I'm going to add some tomatoes. And I always add the tomatoes just at the end because I don't want them to become overcooked. But adding tomatoes gives it a little sauce to it. It just adds a little liquid to it that makes it taste good and good for you. Unless, of course, you're avoiding those nightshades, and then you'll just have sweet potatoes in there and, and not have the... Uh, and you could put onions or into this as well, too. Um, I have a family of big fans of onions, and they love onions in their kale. Onions also help with digestion. So and if you have a hard time digesting foods, onions should, might aid in that. And this time of year, the Vidalia onions have just come out, so they're nice sweet onions to add. The kind of sugar that we're, or the kind of sugar, the kind of salt that we're using is the Celtic salt, which... Um, you can get it where it's ground up, or, or I like to be able to grind it fresh. It just has a much nicer flavor to it. So the Celtic salt is very healthy. It has natural um, minerals in it that make it good for us as well as good tasting. So. Okay, this is about ready. Just want to make sure that it's totally heated through. And then we're going to pass around some little cups, and you guys get to sample it. How was the granola? Did you get to try it? It was good, yeah. Real simple, basic, very healthy. Oh, good, yeah. The, and, and she, she had bought, she did, the, she did the grocery shopping, Susan did the grocery shopping for this, and those dried blueberries are fantastic. If any of you, hopefully, you all got one. If you didn't, they're, they're wonderful, and um, they make a good addition. Cranberries, you've got to be careful, because most cranberries are, are sweetened with uh, corn syrup. So uh, not necessarily one I'd recommend. Uh, make sure you look to see what kind of sweetener that they're using if you're getting a dried fruit. And also that it doesn't have sulfur, sulfites in it right. because a lot of dried fruit does have sulfites in it and we certainly don't want any of that. Oh, Whole Foods. Whole Foods. Yeah. yeah, Whole Foods. Whole Foods, yeah. actually, and I'm so happy that you said that. Whole Foods donated all of our food today, so shop Whole Foods. That was really a, a good thing that they did for us. They support Autism One. They put our flyers out, and um, they've done a lot of good things to help us. So I'm going to move this over and let you guys sample that. I want to... Uh, we'll get set up for our next Moving Right Along. If we can do this whole day without burning ourselves, it'll be really great. for serving, but for putting it, the portions in there. Thanks. Okay. So did you count out how many people you have? Okay. Oops. So tortillas, as we start to, to move in here and bring all of our ingredients forward, um, tortillas can be made with so many different types of ingredients. And, and we, you know, you're so used to the basic flour tortilla, the wheat tortilla that you get from most, um, any, any time that you find in the regular restaurant or store. Um, and then you have, of course, the corn tortilla, which we've already talked about. Not necessarily saying you have to completely give up corn, but we just want you to be able to be aware of it and limit corn whenever possible. Um, so I, I, if you're in a hurry and you really don't like to do a lot of flat, making flour blends yourself, then I do recommend uh, Allergy Grocer, which is formerly known as Miss Robbins, or they still have the Miss Robbins packages, but Allergy Grocer, which is allergygrocer.com. You don't have to Google that one. I'm going to tell you what it actually is. <laughs> allergygrocer.com. They have an actual flour tortilla mix, which is a rice um, tortilla, and you basically just add some oil and water, and then you, you, that's more of one that you would take a rolling pin to, and you would have to dust it, and, and you would roll it out, and then make tortillas that way. 
Um, my family loves tortillas because we make a lot of things like hot pocket type things where I make a flour tortillas and then we take whatever we have in the house and stuff it. Um, I, uh, refried beans are a big one. We, use, we do a lot with black refried beans, organic black refried beans. But we're going to have some other type things for you today to try. You could grind up any kind of meat, ground chicken, ground beef, any of those. Those would be a great okay. addition. This is good. This is getting hot. So, uh, I'm yeah, sorry. I would add a little bit of time because we don't know where the consistency. A little bit of what? The water and stuff. Oh, at the, at the time, yeah. Okay. Um, on this recipe that you have here, and hopefully you have it in front of you, um, adjust the, the, the water. We um, found yesterday that it did, it was a little too watery. So it calls for a cup, of wa a cup and a half of water. We, I'd recommend just a cup of water and just cross out the half. So we have here the flour blend. We have, um, a, we have the, the blend of brown rice flour, uh, tapioca starch, and sweet rice flour. And then we're going to add in here some salt. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> some will come out. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There. And then I'm going to add in a little bit of the water time. Please make sure you have a whisk. Um, don't use, you know, that's, it's just, it's just a really simple tool that you can have for your home that will, thank you, that will make everything much easier. Okay. So you're making like a paste. That's going to need it all. Because this, this, is, this is the lower adjusted okay. amount. I just, so. And you just want to just keep whisking until you get all of the lumps out. Now this is not one that you have to roll. You don't have to roll this recipe. I'm going to add some oil in here. This is actually grapeseed oil. And you don't have to roll this recipe. You can make it more like a pancake. Now, the nice thing about using cast iron is you don't have to coat your pan with a lot of, of oil. If you had to use a pan where you coated with a lot of oil, you're going to get a very different texture. By putting it on more of a dry, heat as opposed to an oily heat, where oily heat's going to fry it more and it's going to be more crispy. And that might be a benefit. That may be something that your child would like, but you're not going to be able to bend it very well if you do it that way. So if you want, a, if you want more of, see if you can see this consistency, it's just like wallpaper paint. Um, I'm, I'm not going to add very much. I'm just going to add enough, like just a couple drops, just to make sure that I coat the bottom. Do I by chance have a utensil for this? I hear. I thought maybe no to oh to move that around to move it around maybe maybe yay okay so just uh, actually a rag would probably be the best thing to do instead just to kind of disperse it but that's good okay so uh, we're, we're talking just light 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 coating and this might be a little too toasty. So I'm just going to pour. It's going to go just like a, just like a hamburger, or not a hamburger, a pancake. And in the meantime, it's going to take a while. We have some finished ones done. Very well wrapped up, I might yeah. add. Okay, you see what that looks like? And so you can, these are very, very easy to roll. If you use too much oil, you would not be able to do this, to be able to have it that pliable. I'm going to cut some of these up for you to sample, and I'm going to put some hummus, which is also another good snack and protein, and some shredded carrots. You could add some more papita seeds, um, pumpkin seeds to it. You could add some olives. You could, there's a lot of different things you could add to it, but this will give you a good opportunity to at least sample it. And okay. I, I want to show you how I knew, know it's done. Basically, it's just kind of bubbly on both sides, so you can see it. 
it's also very hot. <laughs> so I'm going to put that down. I don't know how many I should make, if I should stop making them or just make a couple more. Now, in this size pan, I really could comfortably make either a very, very large one, which would be perfectly fine, or I can make smaller ones. And I'm always big that when you're working with picky eaters, to make everything small. Small sizes, small portions, small meatloaf, small everything, because it just is so less overwhelming that way for the child. And then they feel like they've achieved something. Ooh, I finished it, as opposed to always not being able to finish. One of the things with meatloaf, just because Betsy mentioned that, making the small sizes that I really love to do is you can make meatloaf in muffin tins and, and you can, the mini muffin sizes, you can make meatloaf recipes into meatballs and, and, and it does have, gives you some portion control. You can, it doesn't take as long to cook and you can make a lot of them and stick them in the freezer and then all you have to do is pull it out and you've got an instant meal ready to go for your family. These taste really great fresh. Um, four of you are going to get a fresh one. Um, but they, they're, they're not too the rest bad of you the will next still day. be happy. You will. You'll still. Yeah. Were you here earlier? OK. OK. Yeah, we, we, just, we, we just talked about corn and, and the fact that it feeds gut bacteria and how it's also, it's a number one brain allergy. A lot, of, a lot of people have brain allergies to corn, so it may not show up on an IgG testing, but you could still have a problem with corn from brain allergy. Actual brain, yes, actual, your actual brain allergies. We actually have antibodies within our brain foods as well, too. The brain and the gut are very, very closely connected. And if you ignore one or the other, it's just, it's, it, you have to, they have to be in sync. And if you're upset here, you're not going to be able to think properly here. And, um, you know, it, we also talked about genetically modified, how we don't want to be eating a lot of genetically modified food, and corn is one of the main genetically modified crops. So um, corn is fine. I, like corn on the cob is, is a better option, if at least it's fresh. But corn does sit to mold. When it's on, the, when it's, you can see it in like October. Just drive into anywhere who graces corn, you can see it. And it sits there and dries. And that's this, this corn that they're making grain out of. And it, it basically just gets this thick black mold in it. And that goes right into the process. And that mold, as well as that, like that same peanut mold, is what really will feed those bacteria. Oh, you certainly can make this into tortilla chips. And you can ma make this into a dessert, too. You could put cinnamon and, you know, some, maybe some, some coconut. Co yeah, coconut would be good on them and, and do something like that. But yeah, these would, be, these would be great in the ways of tortilla chips. If you want to do a tortilla chip, then I would recommend more of deep frying them. If you want them really crispy, then you'd want to deep fry them instead. Could you make the little pancakes and then deep fry them, right? Yeah. Yeah, or just if you had your if you had a, a a pan where you could just drop them in, that would that would quarter them first. Yeah, that's a great idea. Big yeah, chips. big chips. Yeah, I love one of my favorites is the those um, they do make a hummus chip that is um, that is doesn't have any other things in it because Plockies, a company Plockies, makes a hummus chip and it's just made from bean flour. Um, and they're like, they, they taste to me a lot like corn chips, but they're made from bean flour. Plockies, P L O C K Y, apostrophe -E -Y -S. S. Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it that? They also make a black bean and rice chip, too. Okay, so I'm going to try some. We're moving just fine here. We have another volunteer. We have a tray of uh, these to sample when you have a chance. I think, does, does Whole Foods have plockies? The, yes, Whole, they do. Okay. All right. What did you think of the kale? Glad you liked it. This is for the fried chicken, correct, Susan? Yes. 
And I don't think our fried chicken ingredients are down yet. Just. An another thing Shh, they have. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you need to write a book. I said, they have. Yeah. I just talk. That's my thing. Oh, good. Is that for the fried chicken? Good. Yeah. Great. I'll so go help over there. Pardon me? I'll go help. Um, um, no, 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 don't take Sorry. it. No, anything that I want to go, I'm putting, like, like you can take what's underneath there. Okay. That'd be great. Oh, oh excuse me. I'm going to need another. Are you one of the I found it. I need another a clean pair of tongs or these more. Okay. I'll take these just a Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I didn't see it. That's great. I'm good. Um, the chicken. No, there's, there's a raw packet because I'm going to make some, and there a, should be a tray with flour. So I've got some. It's in that cooler. Huh? Do we have some cards yeah. that maybe we can answer yeah, while we're waiting? Ask Olive. She knows where Is there any cards? I can go around and pick up spaces. cards and pass them to the center. That'd be great. Yeah. It's probably in the refrigerator. <laughs> Cookware. Um, you know what? Teflon is a bad thing. And here we are showing you with Teflon. And the only reason we're doing that is because, because in this environment that we are working in right now, we, um, we, don't, have, we don't have a whole lot of options. We don't have a kitchen. Um, but I don't recommend using, using nonstick. We would use cast iron, or I'm a big all-clad fan. Um, even though it's expensive, it's a good investment. And uh, um, all clad. All clad is a great brand of of cookware that is um, that is not aluminum. That's gonna gonna be really good for you. Um, but the only reason I'm doing this, I apologize, is is because building a kitchen here, right in front of you, we have to rely on some things that aren't as good. Um, the next thing we're gonna make is fried chicken, and uh, it's one of Betsy's favorites. My very favorite. And my mother was raised on a farm. The only thing she knew how to cook when she and my father got married was fried chicken, and she made the best fried chicken. Hi. She had my uh, children convinced that she sold her recipe before. to the colonel, actually. <laughs> and, and it's so funny, she, they totally believed her. And I, I don't know, they were like teenagers, and my kids are 35 to 25, so it's been a while since they were okay. little. But, but when they were teenagers, they said something we about, well, how did Grandma get that recipe to the colonel? It's like this family joke that somehow they, they were we convinced that it was true. So when I was first diagnosed as being gluten intolerant, I wanted fried chicken. Yes. And, and yes, so the way that I, we, we had a lot of hours of playing with different flour blends and different spices good. and different ways to make this gluten and dairy free and still taste good. And um, I believe we have a winner. Um, That's great. One of the things that it's going to take a few minutes here is um, I'm cooking this in coconut oil, expeller pressed coconut oil, because expeller pressed is the type of coconut oil that is good for, for higher heats. I'm going to cook this at about 350 degrees, which is easy for me to do because I have this electric skillet, but you could use a thermometer you, or, or just cook this under a medium you work on this? Yes, I certainly would. Thank you. What you want to use a medium high heat? Yes. Is, um, is it SCD legal? Yes. Yes, it is. The flour that I'm putting on it is not going to be SCD legal, but um, but you could you could put a coconut flour or something like that to to um, coconut flour would actually be a good way. And you could actually use coconut flour if you were trying to do this totally SCD versus grinding up. Um, coconut. They, they now sell Bob's Red Mill and um, Tropical, Tropical Traditions. Traditions is where I, I get mine from Tropical Traditions. It's a lot less expensive and I order it all through the internet where I can get bulk of flour and the oils. Tropical Traditions is a really good company for your coconut oil, your flours, or even lotions and, and um, anything. It's just it's a great company. They're, they're, a, they're, they're a good company. I mean, you know, not just the fact that they make good products, but they're, they give a lot back to the, 
environment and tropical traditions. This is what it looks like. This is the label right here. Okay, now if this happens, <laughs> this is why you don't want to refrigerate. Well, coconut oil. Here, the reason that I refrigerated this coconut oil is because one of the things that I do with my, with my fried chicken, I reuse coconut oil for fried chicken, but then I do have to refrigerate it, and, and that is why. And I, oh, I, I meant to take it out this morning early so it would get a little softer. That's all right. But, um, but that's why you're it struggling. It gives me something to do. It gives you something to do. So anyway, fried chicken is, um, is wonderful. It's delicious. And and um, a good way to eat a, a nice backyard picnic it, barbecue. It's great in lunch boxes too. This is this is my favorite thing about the fried chicken, boy. I mean, I have no complaints the next day after a day of fried chicken, and everybody's everybody gets it in their lunch, and it makes yeah. it very easy. And the good news for you all is that I have made fried chicken yesterday that's heating up for you, so everybody gets to sample fried chicken while I'm cooking that, so that'll be fun. But, um, <laughs> Gosh, you don't have to wait for me to do this. <laughs> okay. well, I'm, I'm well, getting there. Be patient. Uh, so the, the keys to really good fried chicken are a number of them. One of them is you want to use the right oil. The other is that you want the oil to be at the right temperature. Because if, the, if it is not hot enough and you put something that you're frying into that sort of lukewarm oil, it doesn't immediately fizzle, and then it's going to absorb and it's going to be greasy. You don't want greasy fried chicken. So getting the oil hot enough without being too hot is the balance that you want to make sure you do. The other thing, when you're turning chicken, don't turn chicken with a fork because you poke it and then all the juices run out and now it's going to be dry. So, so get a good pair of tongs for turning the chicken. The other thing that, and, and this is going to take some time, is that... Um, once, once we get all this oil back in there and, um, and heat it up, it's 10 minutes on one side and then 8 minutes on the other side covered. So you want a tight-fitting pan. I mean, it's easy for us to do because we're using this electric skillet, but, but I, I usually, I think I, I have, I thought I had it up here. I usually use an all-clad skillet to do that, and I have, I have this giant... I see the lid for it. I don't see the bottom for it. But it's it's a good sized. No. No, that's not that's not it. That's a cast iron one. But anyway, I have this giant all-clad skillet that works so well for making fried chicken because it, it fits tight and it it does what you want. Um, so the flour. I'm using a flour blend here that is brown rice. And, and any, any good blend will work, but what I have used, for, so you know, is brown rice, tapioca starch, um, potato starch, and sweet rice flour. It's a combination of those four flours. You can buy, and, and if somebody has more questions about that, I will give you the specifics on it. But um, there are some ready-made gluten-free flour blends, and and many of them would work just fine with this, as long as they don't have the, the um, ingredients that you're avoiding, like cornstarch or things like that. However, you don't want to get a blend that has xanthan gum or guar gum in it. The, we need xanthan gum and guar gum when we're using gluten-free flours to help bake, to hold things together, but we don't want to do that when you're doing something like, like sauteing chicken because it's going to make it gummy and sticky, and so that would be a problem. So I have my flour already there, and I'm going to add to it some salt and pepper that, again, I mixed up last night. And then there are two seasonings that I like to add to the flour blend, and this is what I think makes the chicken taste really good. And one of them is tarragon, use dried tarragon. And when you buy dried spices, a good thing to do is to crunch them up so that you can release that flavor. You know, those dried spices have been stuck sitting in that jar for a while. And if you just pinch them and, and squeeze them a little bit, you'll notice they smell so much better and more intense. And if they smell better, they're going to taste better. The other seasoning that I am using is chervil. And chervil sometimes is hard to find. 
like yesterday when I was trying to buy it for this conference. So I'm using parsley instead. It's probably the only time in my life that I would use dry parsley is adding that in place of chervil. Chervil and parsley are very similar in flavor. They're both very mild, light seasonings. And I'm just going to put the lid on so this heats up a little so it cooks faster, faster. Um, so it works best. You can do this on a plate, but I love doing it in a plastic bag because you mix it all up. You've got your flour good and ready to go. And then I'm going to add chicken. And do I have gloves up here? I thought that I put gloves on that tray. No. Um, I'm going to wait a minute while these gloves. Do you mind getting me some gloves? That way I don't have to run back and forth to the kitchen and wash my hands. That's good. I'm sorry? The flour blend that I, I used, and, and I don't have the exact measurements, but I would be happy to give you, is brown rice flour, tapioca starch flour, sweet rice flour, and Oh, and potato starch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But you can't use it. Authentic Foods makes a good one, a good blend. I, I'm not um, as much of a fan of the Arrowhead Mills brand. Do you, do you like that blend? Um, I really like Authentic Foods yeah. brand. And they make, they make another brand that you wouldn't use for this. The, the thing with these gluten-free flours, it gets, it's, you know, you've got 12 bags of flour all over your counter and it drives you crazy. And my half my refrigerator is filled with flours because they... They get rancid, so you don't want to keep them out. Um, I use two particular blends. I have the Authentic Foods Multi-Blend Gluten-Free Flour is probably one of my favorites because it already has xanthan gum in it. It's a nice blend of flours. You can bake cookies, things like that that you want to have in moderation, but it's a good, easy one to have on hand. The problem with it is it has cornstarch in it. If you want the recipe for this particular flour blend, there is a book called Cooking Gluten-Free. I actually have it with me, and maybe at the break I'll bring it out so you can look at it. And it gives you the recipe for this particular flour blend, and then I make it myself, and in place of cornstarch, use arrowroot. So then you have this great flour blend that, that works really well. Um, and then if you wanted another blend, without xanthan gum, you could take that same mixture and just hold out the xanthan or guar gum. And now you have one with xanthan gum, one without xanthan gum, depending upon what you're doing. You can tell the difference in a good quality blend as to a knot, or in flowers in general, in how smooth they are. That's why I'm not a big fan of um, Arrowhead Mills, because they're, they're, and some of the Bob's Red Mill, too, can be a little grainy. If you find a flower that's grainy, it's just going to change the consistency of your food. If it's really nice and finely milled, you're just going to get a smoother taste throughout. Um, uh, there, if you... Yeah, you want, if you want to talk, otherwise I have some questions. Go ahead, answer, answer your questions. Um, somebody had asked about what was the oil used when you cook, the oil used when cooking kale. Um, I think we, today we use grapeseed, but right. olive oil would also be another good option for that. Um, and then asked about the, the nightshade vegetables. We mentioned that in the lecture, so I don't know if the person who asked wasn't here, but the nightshade vegetables feed parasites, and those are um, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant but not sweet potatoes. Yes, thank you. White potatoes, I should have said that specifically. Is stainless steel cookware okay? Yes, stainless steel cookware is okay. Um, and it, you know, different types, though, are gonna heat better than others. So that's why things like the all clad will have a better even disbursement of the heat. Um, for baking, my favorite, I am, I am a, a big, Pampered Chef loves me because I love Pampered Chef. I don't sell Pampered Chef, so reps from Pampered Chef love me even more because I just say, you know, find a good rep, get some good pepper, Pampered Chef stoneware. I think it's just a great way to, uh, to bake is if you have some good stoneware to, to cook and, with. And it's totally nonstick once it's seasoned. I, I am so impressed. I had one Pampered Chef pan that I never used until Betsy came to my house with... Um, making one of my recipes for crab cakes using the Pampered Chef pan. Oh, did I? And, and I couldn't believe how well it worked. It didn't stick at all. So I, I have become a Pampered Chef fan. I, yeah, I love it a lot. So that's, that's these questions here. Um, okay. 
thighs. I'm just chicken, using chicken thighs in general. Chicken thighs are the, the least expensive sometimes part of the meat. You can get them very affordably at grocery stores. And to buy packages Wait, of, can I interrupt yeah, you? Just ahead, wanna, so I just want to show you this little thing here. I, you know, there's little pieces of the chicken that you cut off because they're, they're skin or fat that you don't want to include. I always hold on to that piece because that's how I check to see if my, my fat is hot enough. And when I put it in and it sizzles right away, I know that that fat is hot enough for me to add the chicken. Good. So the, the, but the thighs are a very affordable part. And the thighs have the most amount of nutrition than any part of the meat because the dark meat is where a lot of those minerals and, and the nutrients are. So do the thighs. And if you're a fan, like I am, of some of the, the teachings of Weston A. Price as well as Julie, Eat the skin. Chicken skin is chicken so, skin. so good for you. And we have just gotten so afraid of it. These are the good fats. These are the fats that our brain and our hormones and our neurotransmitters, that's what they need. So you want to be eating the skin of the chicken. My son loves it. And I will roast a chicken. And I take off all the outer part of the roasting that's nice and crispy. And I serve it to him. And he just loves it. And it's so good for him. OK, so the. I just want to get, when I do fry the chicken, I do it skin side down. So you're going to cook the skin side first, get a nice crispy coating on there. Other things that are important to remember, which really don't apply for us today because I just have one package here of chicken that I'm doing, is don't overcrowd the pan. If the pan is too crowded, what happens is it starts to steam and it lets off liquid. And then instead of just frying, which is what we want it to do, and I'm covering that, of course, instead of, of frying, it's going to steam. And then the, instead of having a nice crispy skin, you're going to have kind of a, a gooey skin. So you don't flip the chicken I, All I do is put it in flour. I don't put any milk. I don't put any batter. And, and it gives it a nice crispy coating on the outside. These are the ones that we made last night that we're reading, and we do, we do have more. So this is going to go ahead. Right. Oh, nightshade vegetables. Yeah. What, what about them? Yeah. Parasite. Not. You just, you just want to limit them. I mean, you can't, you, it's not that you can't do them at all, but uh, it, it can be a problem if you, if, especially for adults with fibromyalgia or children with parasite problems. If you have a parasite problem, it's going to feed those parasites. So you just, right, those particular vegetables are potatoes, tomatoes. So, so, and, and it's, and it's, is, you know, and if you're, if you don't have a parasite problem or, or you've got it under control, it's not to say you can't have those because, I mean, those foods are all part of our, our diet. It's just that if, if, you, if you're dealing with, just like with yeast, if you've got a bad yeast problem, you're going to have to back off on it for a while. And if, just the same, that's the same piece. I'm sorry, what? Yes. Or no, they don't carry parasites. They feed parasites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, there's, there's, I mean, an excessive amount, I wouldn't recommend them because it's also one of, it's one of the top IgG allergens, but um, tomatoes, you know, can be one of the top allergens, but no, and we shouldn't have a problem if that's, that's the case. Yeah. We might need to address that as a panel at the very end, um, because I, I don't feel that it's fair enough for me to just say that without Julie and Susan's input on that. So we'll, we'll talk about that at the very end, because there's a lot of different ways and, to test for that. And, and I'm gathering everyone's questions so that uh, and anything that's relevant that we can talk about right now, like the recipes I'm handing to them as we go, and then we have the Q&A at the end. So if your questions aren't being answered right now, we will get to them. Right. As we do our, we need roller skates. The kitchen is about the other end of the hotel. We have a little back door that we can go flying back. The hotel is wonderful, and they provide this kitchen for us to, to be able to use, and they give us our own area and all the things that we need to prep everything for you. 
but we need roller skates. The, you know, this coating also can be used for vegetables, too. You can use this and take zucchini. Um, my family loves fried zucchini, so we'll either sometimes slice it or put it in, like, french fry sticks and, and use this same type of a recipe. Now, if you can do eggs for something like a piece of, um, like a, a zucchini, then you, what you, the best thing to do is to have it nice and dry, dip it in flour, like just a plain just flour, then dip it in the egg, and then dip it in the coating mix. That will give you the best stick for it. But if you can't do eggs, what you can use a replacement of eggs for that is coconut milk. So you can dip it in a little flour, dip it in a little coconut milk, then dip it in, in the blend, and then, um, deep, and then you can fry those. And those work really great for kids that are picky vegetable eaters. You can do it with all different types of vegetables. You like it's just a plain rice flour or something just like that first. That will just it just helps to absorb any moisture that's right directly on it because the egg won't stick really well to a vegetable unless if it has any moisture on the outside. And and, and because they sweat, vegetables sweat and constantly releasing moisture, the flour will help that. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and this is something that we struggle with as a team to present to you too. We know this is overwhelming. We know this is a lot of information, and we don't expect anybody to to go from a Frito French fry diet to the next day eating all these same foods. But we may only have one opportunity to tell you this. And we want to make sure you hear as much information as you can. And then maybe, like right now, you take one thing back. You know, you take back t uh, a piece of just, just do water. No juices, no sodas, just, we're just going to drink water. And then, you know, down the road, you're going to see something else. And you're going to think, oh, I remember what they talked about organic. Let's, why don't we, now that organic's more available in our store, why don't we start buying organic? And just take what you can and don't get overwhelmed about any of this. And, you know, like we've said before, we're not saying to t you, that you must give up nightshade vegetables or, or, or you must give up, you know, corn and like that. We're just kind of telling you the reasons why they may bother your child. Well, that's and, what I want to know. I mean, yeah. Know. Right, right. And, you know, there's no better person than yourself for monitoring if it food affects your child. I mean, food diaries are the greatest things that you can do to really take to note, you know, Okay, let's see. After he eats these foods, after he eats these Fritos, I've noticed that his hyperactivity really increases. Or the nights that he, you know, when he goes to bed after eating a soy yogurt, I notice he doesn't sleep well or he urinates in his bed. Those are the things that a food diary will help you take note of. You start to see patterns develop, and then you can say, you know, maybe I should look at this piece as well. And and I just want to piggyback on what you were saying about so you don't feel overwhelmed. When I, I am gluten and dairy intolerant and soy and sugar and on and on, corn, all of those things that I have problems with as well. And in the beginning, all I did was find a brownie that was free of gluten, dairy, and soy, you know? It wasn't health food. It was just I found an acceptable substitution for everything. I found gluten-free pretzels, gluten-dairy, soy-free pretzels. And, and then, as the more I learned, I learned about nutrition and I learned about balancing. And it's just like the, the onion skin layers, you know? There's layers and layers to learning. We want to give you the benefit of everything that the three of us have amassed over the years and dump it all on you in one day and not to overwhelm you, just so that you have those pieces that during the year you can say, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I'll try this now. Maybe I'll add this to my diet. Not to overwhelm you, not to say our way is the only way, just to give you some tools and some suggestions to make it a little bit easier because we know it's helped with us and with our children. Um, the reason that I got this out is because, obviously, chicken's going to take 20 minutes to cook, and I thought that we don't need to stand here and watch Although chicken fry. Although I have to smell it. It smells really good. And, and how did it taste? Has everyone had a chance? To? That's great. That's good. Um, so I'm going to start while that's cooking. Betsy, if you want to check yes. that in a few minutes, I think it's fine now, but it, it'll, it'll need to be plate. turned. Okay, turned. I do. 
it'll be turned and make you in one more time. Um, the next thing that I'm making is called cauliflower rice, which sounds kind of silly. Um, we all know that cauliflower is a great vegetable. It's got lots of good fiber, and it's, it's good for us. Um, it's also allowed on the SCD diet. It's allowed on all these diets. And they make cauliflower mashed potatoes, cauliflower everything. Um, I make cauliflower rice. And, and I have served this to even my mother, who is right up there with the pickiest of eaters, and she didn't know she was eating, she thought she was eating rice. So you just take a whole head of cauliflower. You don't even have to cut off the, um, that, that center core. Just cut it in pieces that will fit through your food processor. And it is one that, that you'd probably need a food processor. But you want to use the, the grating blade because you're just going to grate it. You're going you're to turn it into rice. I, I do some work with Whole Foods and Wild Oats, and I do some food demos for them. And I demoed this at a store, and... A father said, you know, asked me what I had, and I said, well, I have this cauliflower. Oh, my kids won't eat that. And, of course, they ate it and loved it, and he was always really surprised. I think part of it's that... More? No, I think that's good. Okay. I think that kids will eat anything in a little cup. So pre present <laughs> presentation is really important. That's a great point. Um, so can you... I don't know if you can see that chicken, but it's I'll a nice golden up. brown color, and, um, yeah. That's when you want to turn it over, and the first side is usually about 10 minutes, and the second side is 8 minutes. But presentation is really important, and that's part of the picky eating issue that you might think about. I bought all kinds of Tupperware, multicolored, segmented bowls and plates and things so that for serving, thanks, for serving um, food, we could have lots of options for people. You know, let them have an orange plate for their breakfast and a blue one for lunch. And if they don't want their vegetables and meat touching, they, they make a lot of cute little segmented things. They have little cartoon characters on them if you want. But it is just another fun way to do this. I'm going to make a lot of noise now, so uh, bear with us. It's on the grater setting, not the chopper. You want the grater. And if you don't have a food processor, you can just use a standard handheld grater. Watch your knuckles. Yeah, watch your knuckles is right. Go faster. Throw things around. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh, woman putting that too. <laughs> Okay, so I have grated this up, and I just want to show you. I mean, it does totally look like rice. You have these little granules. And instead of steaming or cooking or baking it, we're going to saute it, again, in a healthy oil. And um, um, unplug this and it's out of the way. I'm coming back with my spices. So we want to saute it, and, and we want to season it. There's a number of different seasonings that, um, that I think work well. Is that? I just turned it on, oh, okay. so it's going to take a while. Good. There's a number of seasonings that I'm going to use. What I'm going to do today is use some dill and a little lemon zest. Um, dill, when you cook it with vegetables, or if you cook it with eggs, it tastes like butter. It gets a very buttery 
flavor to it, which when you can't have butter is a nice addition. So I love to use, I saute something in, in a nice healthy oil or fat, and then I add some dill and, and it really tastes like it's been, I don't think that's been long enough. More time. Spices in general, please get involved in learning about a lot of spices. Spices can be just the, the, the main, the only thing you need to turn a boring food into a very exciting food. Absolutely. I'm a huge spice person. My, my father was a chef as well, and I grew up with lots of spices. And he always let me taste things, and he would say, very German, very stern. Susan, what do you think this needs? And if I said to add cinnamon to spaghetti sauce, he would let me put cinnamon in and see what it tasted like. Mm. Or he would say, what do you think? And he'd hold out two or three jars and let me smell them. And I totally got into it. I mean, it was so much fun. It's very, the only time I was ever able to use this skill to my benefit was I went to a, a party, one of those showers where they have these party, you know, party games. And they had these little Dixie cups with a tray of spices, and you, you couldn't taste them. You just had to smell them. It's like, oh, piece of cake, blah, blah, blah. I knew all of them, and I was the only one that got them all right. But, but, um, but using spices and seasonings really can enhance the flavor of your food and, and get your kids excited about eating things. You know, we talk about food at my house all the time. Me too. My husband finds this a little obnoxious, but my kids like it. You know, I mean, he's like, do you notice how much you talk about food? But I can tell you that I have raised four boys that love to cook. Their wives are now very happy for that. They, they're good cooks. They, they participate. And my grandchildren like to cook, as a, a cook and eat as a result of it. Yes. Doesn't that look beautiful? Penzi's is a good company. I mean, you can get some great uh, spices at like Trader Joe's or um, uh, Whole Foods and such. But um, Penzi's also is a, is a good company, P-E-N-Z-E-Y-S. And you can go to penzi's.com. They are gluten-free. They are not organic. Um, and there are some good companies that are organic. But uh, Penzi's is a little bit more readily available, and they have some really good blends. So if you are not creative and you know absolutely nothing about spices, no. with Penzi's you can get like poultry seasoning or lamb seasoning, and it's already put together without the MSG and, and all those other icky things that they. P e n z e y s. Yes. Apple pie spice or Thank mixed you. spices, they always have gluten. And so if you're going to, you want to make sure it's specifically a gluten-free company. That, that's, you know, the reason that I got involved with Penzase, buying spices from Penzase, is because of that very reason. When, um, because I have celiac disease, which is a little different than, than, um, than what you're dealing with, but I had to be very careful so not to have questions. any gluten. And any kind of a spice blend is potential gluten territory. Um, and any kind of seasoning that you get from out of the country, they don't have to label that there's gluten in there. A, a great example of this is one of the first cooking classes that I taught was making crab cakes. And one of the seasonings was Coleman's mustard powder. And I thought, there couldn't be any gluten in mustard powder, it's just mustard, you know? And you look on the label, it doesn't say anything. But because I wanted to be certain, I called or wrote every one of the, um, the companies to make sure that I had in writing that they were gluten-free. And Penzase uses wheat starch to keep it free-flowing. And in the UK, that is considered gluten-free because they use just a real small amount of it. But, so don't use Penzase, or excuse me, not Penzase. Don't use Coleman's mustard Coleman's, powder, yeah. Penzase but, is but Penzase is fine, and that's why I ended up going to Penzase because they were so good at at um, telling me they knew not everything at Penzase is gluten free. McCormick, not, yeah, and, and, Mc, and McCormick's the same as, as Coleman's. And no, McCormick's are, are they, all their individual spices are gluten free, oh. and and Frontier Organic. Um, Mo all the individual spices are gluten-free. What you want to look at is when they start having a blend. And chili powder is a great example. Chili powder isn't one powder. If you bought something that said cayenne pepper or 
ancho chili powder, it would probably be one. But chili powder is a mix, and that's where you're going to end up with things like the yeast and, and other additives that they've put in there to keep it free-flowing, to keep it flavorful, to keep Thank it from getting stale. I, I make my own chili seasoning blends, and I know this sounds like, oh my gosh, she is so over the top. But it really is, is very easy. I am. Maybe a little bit. It's really easy to make your own okay. spices. I buy, I, I go to, to, to Penze's and buy a lot of spices, but when I want to make a chili seasoning, and, and I have a couple of Do recipes to, take, to make chili seasonings, um, you can go to the bulk food section, and they have those individual spices. So it's going to cost you pennies. You're going to get, you know, a teaspoon of this, a teaspoon of that. You're going to mix it all up and have a great tasting um, chili seasoning. So is there a problem? No, 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 not at all. Okay. Somebody had asked a question about McCormick, and that's the reason. Oh, okay, yeah. McCormick okay. individual spices are gluten-free, as are McCormick um, extracts are gluten-free. But there also well. comes into play the whole freshness component where McCormick's can be sitting on shelves for very, very large periods of time where Penzi is a little bit more controlled with that because they're selling them directly. So Penzi is going to have them a little bit fresher. And then, of course, going with companies that are organic is like Frontier or um, why am I not thinking of the other company? Um, Spice Seeds Hunter. Of, Seeds of Change. Is that the Se name of it? Seeds of Change makes one? I'm not sure, but um, Spice Hunter is one. Spice Hunter. Spice Hunter is the other one I was trying to think of. Yes, they're all good, real good organic. So some good and Frontier is great because they don't irradiate any of their spices. Oh, very yes, good. I didn't that's know right. that. So ira when they irradiate them, uh, I don't know all the reasons, but I think part of it's bacteria and things, and they basically use some sort of nuclear radiation and spray it on the herbs and Frontier does not do that. I didn't know that. That's really good to know. Yeah, that is good to know. Um, this is just taking a little longer since I have this tiny little heat element underneath there, but um, if you were cooking this at home, it would probably be done in about three, or three to five minutes. Next to my cast iron pan, which I love, which is actually mine. That was mine that I cooked my tortillas on. Um, my second favorite is the, my wok. I have a nice stainless steel wok, and um, I absolutely love it. You know, the, the, the cast iron is so heavy, I never put it away. I just, I use it so often, I just keep it, I have a big one and I have a small one. So we do like little breakfast sausages and things like that in the small one, and then we'll do our, you know, bigger meals in the big one. And then if I have a lot of, like when we were doing the kale and there was so much of it, that's when a wok really comes in handy because yep. it's, it, it's just bowled in and it doesn't fly out as easily. When we do Autism One, I basically take everything in my kitchen and pack it into my car. I look like the Beverly Hillbies, Hillbillies driving down the road. There, I had to fasten my passenger seat belt because I had even the passenger seat loaded with pots and pans and, and, and food and all this great stuff. So, um, but I have a walk and I didn't think to bring that. Next year we'll have a walk. Stirring, stirring. So what, what have we tasted so far? Has, what's your, your opinion on the food? Is this doable? And, and it's easy. It's stuff that you could do at home. It's not going to take you an arm and a leg and all day to do it. You know, with cauliflower, she mentioned earlier about all the different ways that you can do prepare cauliflower. If you have a child you know, that you're wanting to kind of ease some of this into, you can always do like these 50-50 combinations as well, too. I, I love mashed potatoes. I don't like to eat a lot of potatoes because I do follow a little bit of the blood type diet and I'm an O and O's don't particularly do well on potatoes so I don't do a lot. Um, and I don't like my kids getting them because I think they just get too many potatoes. But we like them. So I'll make mashed potatoes and then I have what's called, which Susan introduced me to, it's called a ricer. It's a very old fashioned mm -hmm. tool where you put you can put the um, cooked cauliflower right into the ricer and then you smush it and it comes out absolutely beautiful. And you can do the same thing with your potatoes to make really, really good fluffy mashed potatoes. So you take the potatoes, take the cauliflower, you heat them up, you cook them, and you put them to this ricer and it will make the whole meal just so much, the, the a dish fluffier. And then I add a little ghee to give it that buttery taste. Um, and I use chicken stock a little bit to, if I need to thin, thin it out a little bit, my own homemade chicken stock. And it makes a great, great mashed potato that tastes great. And then you can even take that one step further and make like a patty with it and like fry those up if you have a child who likes 
it's crispy and doesn't like the smooth, you can make a patty out of that and cook it up that way. But my kids, it's so funny, they sit down at the dinner table and they see the mashed potatoes and they just kind of look at me and they're like, so does it or doesn't it? They're like, what did you put in there today? That's so and, funny. Um, but then, you know, the funny thing is, is they don't really mind. They want to know. So what is ghee? Ghee is, um, it's, clar it's clarified butter. So you know when you melt butter and it gets that kind of white foamy part at the top? That's the casein. So if you are not, if you don't have a problem with dairy, if it's not an IgG food intolerance for you, and you can do dairy, then if you, if you heat it up a little bit and you have that casein part taken off. Now, it's very hard to do that. You can do it with cheesecloth and you can make your own, um, but there are some good companies that sell ghee already made because it's used a lot in India. One of the nice things is that it does not turn rancid as fastly as butter does, so you can keep it out and it stays nice and soft, so you can use dollops of it here and there. It's very strong. The casein helps kind of, um, when you have butter, casein kind of helps, and, and then plus, is because it's been heated, the water's been evaporated. So it's a very, very strong flavor. So you don't want to use as much as you would a butter. Certainly do not substitute ghee one for one no. in butter. It would be so tremendously strong um, that you wouldn't like the taste. I particularly like, um, uh, you know, just if, if I have a recipe, I'll put maybe one-fifth ghee and the rest of it olive oil or something like that, and that'll give it G-H-E-E. -E. And the other time, the other thing about ghee is it doesn't brown. I, excuse me, it does brown without burning. It's the it's the milk fat, the um, the, the milk liquid that, that burns when you put butter. You know, if you don't, if you walk away and all of a sudden you have this brown or black butter there, um, ghee will not burn like that. But when I make chicken piccata, I like to use a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of the ghee because it makes the chicken brown very nicely. Indian cuisine, in my opinion, is, is it's my favorite. I, that and Thai food, those are my two favorite foods. They're just so innately healthy because they slow cook everything. And, and I don't know if you've heard of the slow food movement and how we want people to start taking time to cook and using all the wonderful spices. Indian spices are some of the healthiest detoxifiers you can buy. I mean, you're, you're talking chelation in a meal. You, you have a nice... <laughs> You have, a, you have a nice Indian meal with the turmeric and the ginger and the cilantro and all the other wonderful ingredients that go into Indian food. And those are all natural detoxifiers, the, the, the ways that they make the curries and such. So we're going to get that ready for you. And okay. the next thing that we're going to make is, oh, there it is, is lemon pudding. Now. In my office, my husband has a partner that he works with. Her name is Beth, and she's the holistic director of our office. And she's an amazing woman who um, almost died of celiac disease um, about a, over a decade ago and because she was going completely undiagnosed, and they absolutely refused to believe that diet had anything to do with the fact that she was 85 pounds and could not gain weight. Long story, very typical in the celiac world, but she um, was so damaged that she's doing great now because of her own knowledge that what she's gained over the years, but she has a lot of food intolerances. And as she's getting them back a little bit one by one, she created this recipe, and I thank her for that because um, you know she, she had to do a lot of suffering, but she's helped millions of people because of what she's learned in the interim, and she's a, she's a great woman. Her name is Beth Vandeboom. And, and the other thing, and, and she helps me too, she's wonderful. The other thing about this pudding that I just wanted to say is, is we talked about pH and how so many of us are acidic and we need to get a little more alkaline. Lemon is very good for reducing the acid. You think lemon citrus is going to be really acidic and it's not going to be, it's going to make you more acid, but it actually has the opposite effect. Lemon is great. Lemon water, if you put a squeeze of lemon in your water, it helps to do that. So this is a dessert it's free of sugar, free of all kinds of bad things, and it's going to help balance your pH and taste good all at the same time. I just and, thought, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Say, please. I was just going to say, before she dumps these in, I don't know if you can see these egg yolks, but they are orange. They're gorgeous. 
So these are the kind when you look for a truly pastured hen, you're going to get this kind of a yolk. And coincidentally, they're Beth's eggs. Yes, so, yes, <laughs> which she grows, she does, she does her own farming now too. Yeah, this this is an amazing recipe, and and because the lemons clean out the lymphatic as well, you 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 do a lot of other cleansing with it also. So what I started off with was pure maple syrup. Now I used a C-grade maple syrup. It's harder to find C-grade, but you should be able to find B. Um, what what the, the difference is, is that the minerals are left behind after the first pressing. So when you buy grade A maple syrup, they may taste yummy. The reason it tastes yummy and it's not so heavy is because the minerals are left behind. So by the, the, lo, the later of the pressing, then you're going to have, you won't have, uh, then you'll get more of the minerals. So this is a grade C um, maple syrup. And then I'm putting in here tapioca flour. I'm going to make, it's going to make a paste. The other thing about puddings that are, is so wonderful, if you're trying to get your children to, to take supplements, oh yeah, this is a great way to sort of stick it in that spoon there and, and hide supplements. And if they don't like lemon, you can use other flavors. I like lemon. And if you can't tolerate eggs, or if your child can't tolerate eggs, you can make this recipe without the eggs. I know this because I made it for a group um, just last Thursday, and, and I thought, well, let me just see what happens, because the, the tapioca starch certainly thickens, and you know, it, the only difference, it, it had less protein and less fat, and it, um, but it stuck together, it tasted really good, and all of my egg-free people were happy. You didn't have to substitute anything. Oh, flavor-wise? For your, you're making this egg free, you do everything but the eggs, and that's it. Which I was really surprised, because I did it in front of a group, you know, trying something out the first time. It tasted very, very good. And you can use agave instead of maple syrup. It does. Is that right? Yes, I you can do that. it. Um, um, tell me what you want me to do. I, this, this, is, this recipe is like, I'll be so exhausted. I'm so glad. This is the, my last recipe. So I'll be sitting after this, because it takes a lot of arm strength for this. It burns very quickly, and because I don't have good monitoring here of my temperature, I'm really afraid of it burning, which is why I'm whisking like a maniac. You shouldn't have to whisk quite this much at home. When the combination of the maple syrup and the tapioca start to kind of um, bubble, then um, that's when I'm going to add the water. And once you add the water, the tapioca starch is going to thicken, and so then you do have to whisk rapidly to make sure that you don't want to get clumps. Although if you do get clumps, you just keep whisking, and they will work their way out. It's not like the old days of making gravy, where once you got a lump, it was there forever. This will work its way out. And and what kind of tapioca starch you oh, use definitely you. makes a difference. Did we bring it here? I don't think we did. I'll, Shoot, I'll run back the company the is called Essex. E S S E X. They make an absolutely fantastic tapioca uh, flour. The Bob's Red Mill tapioca flour will make this very gummy. It will not taste the same. And it gets stringy. Is starch flour the yes. Tapioca yeah. starch, tapioca flour Sorry. is the yes. same thing. But yeah, different brands. Some of them are a little grainy. That's some not of the truth with potato, though. That's not. That's true. So it's, potato starch is different than potato flour. Sometimes you'll see potato starch flour, and that is potato starch. But if you just see plain potato flour, that's dried, ground-up potatoes, and you wouldn't use that in place of a starch. But anyway, so this pudding is a great thing to, um, to use to, to help get supplements in. Um, I made crepes. I have a recipe for crepes in my cookbook that are gluten and dairy-free again, and, um, and sugar-free. I make it with a little agave. And, and I, for my support group, I did that and filled it with this lemon pudding. It's really good. Another thing you could do, I know I'm just getting Please carried away. Please keep going. Please keep going. While, while we're waiting for, for things to boil, I like to talk about food. Um, with this crepe recipe, and I'm telling you, it's so easy. You, you make the crepes now, don't yes. you? Yes. Okay, so I, I like to have an alternative to cake, and the crepes don't have any, any sugar in them because I you just call for a little bit of agave, you can layer them, maybe put them in a cake pan or a springform pan and layer them. What I, what I did for like Easter, I made crepes and I layered them with lemon pudding and then I added um, some blueberries and fresh mint. There's no sugar in any of it 
it was a spectacular dessert. After you get a, a, a stack of them, um, the next day, I do it the day before, the next day then you can slice it just like you would a cake. And, and it doesn't even get sticky. You know how you think with pudding and crepes the next day it would be all runny? Two days later I was eating leftovers and it was very good. Okay, so as soon as the, the combination of the tapioca syrup and the, um, excuse me, the tapioca flour and the uh, maple syrup started to bubble a little bit, then I added the water. And so this is the part, you know, you just don't want to walk away. It's not worth it. Don't risk losing your batch just from this piece alone because um, it's a, there's like, there's like truly like a 10 second time of which it starts to become thick and it's just like boom, you gotta act fast at that point. Now what I'm gonna do is with this bowl actually, is I'm going to put in here, thank you, that we're gonna put the eggs inside there because, explain this process okay, please. So the, the, it's important to temper the eggs. And what I mean by that is you wanna put a little bit of the hot liquid in and whisk it very, very quickly. We don't want scrambled eggs in our pudding we want the eggs to act as a nice fat and a nice thickener, but we don't want them scrambled. And the way to avoid that is that you take a little bit of the liquid, you whisk it in with the eggs, and again, you, you have to be fast with that wrist to keep that going until the eggs start warming up. As soon as they warm up a little bit, then you add it back into the pudding. We also are gonna put some zest, and fresh squeezed lemon juice is essential. You don't wanna have that little uh, lemon thing there. Talk about Meyer lemons maybe for a little Meyer bit. Meyer lemons. These are not Meyer lemons. These are not Meyer lemons. <laughs> Meyer lemons are a little sweeter. They're, you see them, they're, they're just going out of season now for us. Um, they're a very bright yellow to orange and they're a little bit softer lemon. They're absolutely delicious and one of my favorite things. While they're in season, I go crazy with them. Um, but they're, they're milder, and so if the regular lemon is a little too acidic for you, too acidic tasting, uh, you might want to use a Meyer lemon instead. I actually didn't like the Meyer lemon when I made the Meyer lemon pudding. I thought that I would because I love Meyer lemons. I love the pucker power of this one, mm -hmm. so I do like to make it that way. But, you know, depending on your personal taste, you could use Meyer lemons in place of that. Right. You could use limes and make like a key lime filling for something like that. You can use lem uh, uh, vanilla as well and make a vanilla pudding. Um, if you wanted to make it chocolate, uh, you, if you wanted, or if you have a problem with chocolate, you could potentially even use carob. But if you wanted to make it chocolate, that would be an option too. One of my favorite, one of my favorite, no, I'm okay. okay. One of my favorites is um, you could actually probably in this yes. recipe use Suzanne. Here we go. Suzanne Specialties has a uh, chocolate syrup. It's a wonderful. Ri it's a rice syrup. It's it's rice. Um, it's rice syrup mixed with cocoa, and it's absolutely wonderful. And oh, yes. you could use that and to make some sort of a chocolate pudding as well, too. Okay, I'm just at this point right now, and it's starting to get thick. I'll turn this off. When you add lemon zest, you mean like you're going to put lemon How much lemon zest? It's one, it's this, one this. lemon, the, the zest of one lemon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, can you tip that up so they can I, see? Can you see can you how see thick, how this thick is? that is now? Okay, now we're gonna do just what Susan was talking about. I'm gonna take some of this. Just take a little more, and then you just go really fast to keep it from a. Uh... And once you just have to do that maybe two or three times, just enough so that the the eggs are warmed up and they have tempered, so that they're not gonna curdle or scramble. Um, I have questions before we. we... Can you just just. Um... Would you like to do that, that in here for me? Thank you. Stirring. Okay. Get all that good stuff in there. All that protein of the egg yolk. Right. Okay. Thank you. Good. We're almost there. Do we have the samples of this? Yes, they're, they're, I they're believe they, they're starting they're to get in. samples. Okay. Here's Lemon two. juice. Ready? So, yeah, go ahead. Pour that in. So we use an entire cup of fresh squeezed lemon juice, which I would say is about six lemons. Go ahead. And then... That's one, one lemon. One lemon. The zest of one lemon. What did you think of that cauliflower? 
Wasn't that good? Isn't it? It's such a surprising thing that's so simple and you think oh, it's nothing. But the addition of good seasoning really makes a big difference. The lemon and, and don't you think that dill has a buttery sort of flavor? It's good. I'm okay, glad this you is, like it. Here's the, here's the pudding, finished, done. It's just, and it's wonderful warm. Really, really good warm. You can take the egg whites, especially, I would only do this if you're using organic eggs, um, and take the egg whites then, and I usually put them, you just start whipping them up in your food processor or your, or your mixer until they start to peak. You can add a tad of cream of tartar that makes the peak a little bit stronger. And then once you've whipped them and they're nice and fluffy, then you can add a little of the maple syrup or whatever sweetener that you use to help sweeten up and then put a meringue on top of it as well. Okay. Yay. And you've got a chance to sample the lemon pudding and isn't that wonderful? We are actually finished cooking our GFCF recipes. We're going to take a break for lunch in a, in a few minutes, not quite yet. We have lots of questions already and we thought that since we're done a little bit early and we can breathe for a change, this would be a good time for us to introduce ourselves better and tell you a little bit how you can reach us if you'd like to do so. Again, my name is Susan Vess and I live in Chicago. I live in the suburbs here. Um, I have a website which is specialeats.com. E and should we give our phone number? Sure, whatever contact information. Okay, so and if you wanted to call me, you could do that at 630-846-4605. If you go to my website, specialeats.com, you could send me an email from there. You get my phone number. And, and I do meal planning consults, and, and I work with individuals, short and long distance. Um, I teach cooking here locally and have a cookbook. Yes. And I, I will be selling my book here. And? And, drum roll. Very we exciting. Have, we have a, um, a cooking DVD that is actually going to be delivered here to the hotel tomorrow. We haven't so even seen it yet. We haven't even seen the final version of it yet. But um, it's Cooking with the Seasons. It's, I think I mentioned it's the first in a series of four. It has five entire cooking classes on one video. And when I say entire, I mean it has entrees, desserts, everything for, for five separate meals. All gluten dairy free. All Most gluten of it's dairy corn free. and soy and very low in sugar as well, too. Right. And um, it, we, uh, it's it's great. I think it's the first of its kind. It's done in all in cooking show format, very, very quick, always something going on, something exciting, lots of different meals. It's not, see, the, the dis difference with Susan's cookbook and Susan's recipes, and, and, I, and I, I'm, I just got the privilege of getting to know Julie, so I'm sure her book is phenomenal as well, too. But what I really have to play on Susan's is that Susan's book is not a, these are all the things you need to substitute to make the foods that your child normally eats. So it's not like, you know, just taking a regular recipe where she just crossed out the regular flour and put in rice flour. It's not that at all. So I, I love to tell this story, even though Susan may get annoyed with it, but Susan throws a lot of parties. And I'm really happy she's my friend. Because <laughs> and I, this, this is something I just have to use as an example over and over again because it truly amazes me. She has these parties for like 60 people and, and she cooks the entire, all the, she doesn't cater it in, she, she cooks everything herself and it's, it's a little bit of a control issue too, but she does, <laughs> she does, Maybe. She does cook little. everything herself and everything is gluten and casein free for every guest there. And everybody does nothing but say what a wonderful cook she is, how wonderful the food is. The, the piece is, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not parties on substitutions. It's, this is really good, fresh, wonderful food and you don't Just feel like you're food. missing anything. So that's what I love about her recipes and brought as well. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you. So let's tell, tell us about Betsy. So my husband and I have a medical clinic, 
ah, medical clinic in Wisconsin called Pathways Medical and Holistic Health Center. We are, we used to be Pathways Medical Advocates, formerly known as, and um, we, my husband is a pediatrician and we specialize in children and adults with chronic illnesses. We do a lot of autism. I have a son with autism. He is um, almost 14 years old and he had extremely severe food intolerances, intolerances and as he's healed and gotten better, we've gotten a lot more foods back in, but we're still limited enough. Um, and I, I have two other daughters, uh, one's my son's twin and the other one is 10, and all of them follow a gluten and casein-free diet, um, as well as, as low in soy as we possibly can. I, they are my greatest teachers. I learn, because my children are the three most opposite children, as you can imagine, and they all teach me something different about what picky eating is, and I'm grateful for that. I've been doing diet counseling for 10 years. I started a support group many years ago when nobody even had heard about this diet and um, started helping families to deal with all the different food choices. Back a lo long time ago when I first started to be a diet counselor, I was so much nicer than I am today. <laughs> I, I, I used to be up there and be like, just do what you can, and it's okay if you eat cereal three times a day, and I would just be just so understanding of everybody's place, and part of my passion, and I, and I dare to say anger, and I don't mean to be angry at you. I'm, my anger goes towards the companies who are trying to convince you that their food is healthy when it's not. That's really what my anger more is towards. And, and so that's where a lot of my passion comes in because as I've learned of nutrition and I have healed and I've gotten so much better, I want to help others achieve that. And I, I think it's attainable for everybody. And I think it's um, something that our, our children is the greatest gift that you could ever, ever give your child is to help with healthy eating. Um, so I live up in Wisconsin. And Julie? I'm Julie Matthews, and I'm a certified nutrition consultant. And as I mentioned earlier, I live in San Francisco. I have a practice there. And but I work with people truly from around the country because even people that live 25 minutes away, as you can imagine, your lives are so busy. I often do phone consultations for people almost in my own neighborhood. So I'm happy to work with anyone that needs assistance. I have a radio show on Autism One Radio, and I have a radio show in San Francisco as well that I've been doing with my husband for four and a half years. We have a practice called Healthful Living, and you can find either of us at healthfulliving.org. And most, uh, I could say and or, but most of my autism information is at my website, nourishinghope.com. And that's my book title, Nourishing Hope. And my book's different in that it's not a cooking. I came to this from nutrition, the biochemistry, how to balance the biochemistry, how to look at someone and try to determine what diet might be the best, how to incorporate a combination of maybe some GFCF with some gluten, uh, with some SCD principles and some body ecology, to how to work with an individual and customize something for them. So my book is a lot more about the science, the scientific resources, research, uh, how to determine which diet to start with, how to implement any, so all of those diets we talked about earlier, the low oxalate and all of those, there's resources and information on how to do all of them. So it's, uh, I suppose, a lot more scientific based. And then I teach a little cooking class and I have a little adjunct with some recipes, but for recipes, Susan's book would be wonderful for that piece of it. And I was going to say one more thing here. When we're uh, speaking? Oh, yes, I'm where I'm speaking. And also, Susan has generously offered to let me share her booth for part of the time. So I will have my books also available for sale after, definitely after my talk on Thursday. I'm sorry, Friday. My talk is, I think it's like 11.30. It's the session right before lunchtime. And so I'd love to have any of you come. And one of the questions was, is it going to be a repeat of today? And it, it's not. It's much more, like I just mentioned about my book, it's much more science-based. So we're going to be talking about certain things like fats, but I'm going to talk a lot more about why saturated fat is good, what properties it has, why cholesterol is good, and demystify with some scientific information. So when you go out there and you're serving your kids, pudding with egg yolks, and you can explain to people that are saying, I thought coconut oil is bad, and I thought egg yolks were bad, and you can explain to them now with some science, no, it's good, 
I know it's good, you have misinformation. So it's a lot more science-based. It also talks about inflammatory foods and anti-inflammatory foods and a lot more kind of some of the specifics. I did a similar presentation for the Dan conference a month ago, so it's a little bit more, uh, this would I would say kind of, this is the how-to. My talk on Friday is more of the why and the science behind it. So I'd love to see any of you there. And then we're all going to be doing a Q&A roundtable at, in the afternoon on Friday. Is it Friday? Friday. I think, I think it it's like 2.30ish right. or something so on Friday. So you can come and just ask questions. And, and when we have a Saturday present. And then on Saturday, Susan and I are speaking on, I think it's more basic. It's, it's, more, it's more of it, a basic. It's, it is more GFCF, not cooking as much, obviously not cooking, but we're going to give a GFCF talk that really gets into all the details of GFCF, why you would do this, and, and the various components we'll, of that. We'll try to make it different, although I may tell the Skittles story again. <laughs> um, I did not give my website. My website is pathwaysmed.com, P-A-T-H-W-A-Y-S-M-E-D.com. And our office number um, is 262-740-3000. Um, I'm extension 19. Um, but I'm best through email, um, honestly. I'm very rarely, because I travel a lot, because we have offices in different states, so I travel quite a bit. So email, and I also do a radio show for um, Autism One. I've been doing it since they first started, and I also do a show for Voice America. Um, and a lot of the shows are easiest to obtain at our website at pathwaysmed.com. Although I do things on a lot of other things than just nutrition. I do just some general health stuff as well, too. Um, so. Is there anything else we want to? Well, uh, we're in Delavan near Lake Geneva. We have lots of questions, and most of these questions we're going to answer at the end of the day when we do our Q and A. Oh, I'm but sorry. One more thing. Just I'm sorry. Can you say one more thing. I, I am doing another lecture. Um, uh, yeah, I know, and I'm trying to remember when it is. I, I'm not sure what when it is. I think it's Friday. I'm doing a lecture on supplements. My husband and I are doing it together. I think this lecture is so important and they are always left out of these conferences like this because people are, you're going to hear like, you need to take this vitamin, you need to take this probiotic, and it's just like your basic understanding of supplements. What is a probiotic? What is a mineral? What is a fatty acid? So to help you understand, if you're going to be assigned a bunch of supplements from your doctor, you should know what they, quali what they classify under. And then also to tell you about some dangers, because autism used to be, these conferences used to be about people coming together because they had these great ideas and we all wanted to share. But unfortunately, autism is now a big money maker. And there are a lot of companies, and I'm not saying that they're here, and I'm not trying to diss anybody here, but there are a lot of companies who are going to try to sell you things because you will do whatever you can to heal your child. So we want to help warn you of some of the ingredients and supplements that you want to be careful of and how to know which ones are good enough. Um, yes? In the supplement talk, are you going to talk about, like, don't give um, a probiotic when you give, like, a vitamin or something like that? Because that can well, we would never recommend Nystatin to begin with. But <laughs> so, so no, we're not going to be talking about that because we are very anti any medication as much as possible. We, we work to get people off things like Nystatin. We have natural ways of getting rid of yeast. So, that, so we wouldn't talk about that in relation to medication. And then I have to put a plug in for my husband, if you don't mind. My husband is doing a lecture also on Friday. And I, you, know, you have to be in the frame of mind for this lecture. I'm not recommending that everybody attends because his lecture is on quantum physics. And um, if you thought today was complicated, <laughs> it's, it's a whole other world. But it, if you do have any interest at all in kind of the understanding of quantum physics or understanding of you know, energy medicine, if you have any interest in homeopathy, anything like that, if you have a background in Reiki or you know anybody who does acupuncture, anything like that relates to energy medicine and quantum physics, and he'll be giving a lecture on that. Too. So, that's great. Our combined talk, I can't remember when it is. If somebody wants to, I'm, I'm Saturday at 3.45? Oh, so it's right after our lecture. Oh, good. It's uh, my email is betsy at pathwaysmed.com. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Yours is S Susan. Susan, but my name is spelled weird. S-U-E-S-O-N at specialeats.com. And my email is actually through my Healthful Living site, so it's julie at healthfulliving.org. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Now we can go. Um, I just, we have lots of questions, and, and I'm going to handle 
If you don't hear your question answered now, we, we will answer it at the end of the day when we do all of our Q&A. But I, there was a few that I thought I would pull out. And um, one of them was about making turkey bacon, which is really funny. Someone said how to make turkey bacon. Not that your question is funny. Last year, that was actually one of the things we made because people ask that all the time. Because when you buy this turkey bacon, actually in the kitchen today, they were making some turkey bacon. And one of the chefs came to ask, how do you cook this? Because they're just not accustomed to having something that, that isn't full of the pork fat. Um, when you cook turkey bacon, you need to add some fat to your, to your pan to do that. And um, I would use palm oil. Um, you could use the expeller pressed coconut oil. Or you could use the grapeseed oil. Any of those would work fine. But you do need to have a little oil in there to cook them, because otherwise, They'll stick to the pan and they won't get crisp. And if you want a crisp bacon, that's what you want to do. This leads me to a question that wasn't asked, but you're going to hear it anyway, is wouldn't you just microwave your turkey bacon? Of which we're all very strongly going to tell you today, get rid of your microwave oven. There is no use for it. It's not good for any of your food. If you think of food as in these great, wonderful chains, your microwave oven just basically bursts these lovely chains apart. Do you want to explain it more about microwave cooking? Oh, boy. Um, I know that it denatures the, the protein and really decreases the nutrient content. So my thought is, why bother? And then there's all lots and lots of other information on why it's bad and the science behind it. But just those two reasons alone is enough for me not to recommend it right. to anybody. Right. And, and think of the. I heat it in a pan. pan. It's really, actually, really easy and once you get And used somewhat to it. faster in some yeah. cases. It is. You know, I and I also have a toaster oven yes. that I use to heat things mm -hmm. up. It's so funny that you know how do we heat things up? I was the same way when I stopped using my microwave. It was like, well, uh, I'm going to dirty two pans. Oh my gosh! Imagine that. Um, <laughs> you just get over it. It's so much. It, it's fast. It's easy. It, it's different. And, and we are all creatures of habit. And once we got into that easy habit of stick it in the microwave, push a button, boom, it's done, now we have to change that. They haven't been around for that long that, that it's going to be that difficult for us to go back. But I use um, my toaster oven. And um, I will wrap foods if it's not something that you know I'm going to put on, on a tray. I will wrap it in parchment and put it in the toaster oven and it cooks really fast and it sort of contains it so that it Do not wrap things in, all, in, in, in aluminum foil. foil. It will outgas the aluminum and you will end up with very high aluminum counts. I've seen it. I've seen it in people's hair tests. Parents that put their, everything in their children's diet in aluminum foil and the aluminum just shoots up in their, uh, when they're letting, what they're letting out and what that comes out of their body. Yeah, I don't have one of those. Pan no, Pampered Chef makes a great toaster oven um, uh, clay, clay. stoneware. Thank you, a toaster oven stoneware. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah, I have, and I just so I put everything on top of that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get, get, get from. Is anybody here a Pampered Chef distributor? Because I'm well, like, you know, I have, that, I have that little <laughs> aluminum. I have that same little aluminum, and I just put a piece of parchment down, and, and you can do that as well. I just tear off a little piece of parchment and stick it on there, and, and that'll work until you get your pampered chef, until I get my pampered chef yeah. thing. <laughs> um, um, with a microwave, too, I have to say, even if you're not using it for your food, if somebody in your family is using it, get it out of the kitchen. The electromagnetic waves that come out of that thing is very dangerous for your DNA. That's part of what the quantum physics lecture will teach you. Oh, do you have one that's built in? Yeah. Uh, well, I think if it's not on, you're probably fine. I suppose if you could unplug it, that's even a step better if there's a way to do so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But think of all the extra space you'd have. Yeah. <laughs> if you take that's that out, then you put the range there, and that's what I ended up doing. And many thousands of dollars later, I got and, the kitchen. I, I have to say that when we did this, my husband, sitting in the audience, was a little skeptical because 
For whatever reason, he likes to reheat his popcorn in the microwave, even though he pops it fresh on the stove. Don't ask. I don't understand. So he's very <laughs> concerned to give up his microwave. So if you have any spouses in the audience like mine, what, you, what I did was I said, okay, let's just do an experiment. Let's just unplug it. And we'll leave it there, but just unplug it. And if we can live without it, we'll, we'll see what happens. Then once we survive that test for, say, two weeks, I said, okay, let's just put it in the garage and just see if we can live without <laughs> Gradually. it. Gradually. Yeah. And we lived without it, and then we sold it. We got rid of it. So uh, it's... That might help you. Yes. Steam ovens? I have I not have, used not one. Used steam oven. Um, is that big and hot? Oh, it should seem so. Yeah, as long as there's well, no aluminum in the process. A steam, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what you're speaking of. I know convection ovens blow air around, and, and it helps speed up the cooking process. It slows it down. And I know as a chef that what we like to inject steam to get a nice crust on our bread. So I wouldn't think that that would be a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, no parchment aluminum. paper in place of, of aluminum foil. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, I don't know how Betsy will feel about this, but um, like, I like to grill things on the grill, and, and sometimes I take some vegetables, and I know I don't wrap them in, in aluminum foil anymore, but I'll wrap them in parchment and then wrap aluminum foil around oh, the outside. Yeah because it's nice to be able to take a packet and stick it on the, on the barbecue grill. And just to keep that aluminum contamination at bay, I wrap it first in parchment. And really, I found that I like that better. I don't ever have anything sticking to the aluminum foil, and it slides off, and you get the juices and everything that you want to go with it. The, and I do, and I have those. I, I, I know. But I have to have everything. When I like to steam, when I like to steam things, I like to steam them in like stoneware. Some, you know, if I'm going to steam something, you can get great stoneware with lids on it so that you can actually steam things right inside there, and that's a great way to steam. Well, aluminum is is a neurotoxin. I mean, it, you know, well, just this week, I happened to be on the Right, and. Whatever. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean you, you, you can, it depends. See, if, 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 with, with heavy metals, and we can't really address that too much right now, but with heavy metals, especially mercury, acts as a magnet, and it draws in and intensifies any other metals that you're being exposed to. So, so our kids, because they have heavy metal toxicity, they're going to be even more susceptible to every little piece that they get introduced to. Right. Right. For them. And while he may not have a buildup in a week, right. he certainly probably he could have aluminum floating around in his bloodstream, which could make his poor liver or whatever trying to frantically detoxify it. Okay, so do frozen veggies have the same or close to the same nutrition? Well, the nice thing about frozen vegetables, especially if you're buying them organic, is that to a certain degree, depending on the company, they tend to be picked when ripe, which is a great thing because typically the vegetables that we get, you know, they're picked and then they sit and then they get shipped and then they go in the, the packing and then they go to the grocery yeah. store and they sit, yeah, and all of that. So, so it can take a while. I mean, unless, obviously, like the local farmer's market type stuff is the best, your best option for that. But frozen vegetables can be a good option because sometimes they, depending on the company, they will pick them fresh and then immediately freeze them. So you're getting some really good nutrition. So they can be a great option, but of course, we would all recommend organic. Anything else you want to say about that? And, and organic frozen vegetables are readily available, and I don't think they're as expensive sometimes, especially if you're getting something out of season. You know, I, I always recommend eating with the season for a number of reasons, but if you do want those strawberries in February, buy organic frozen ones. And Cascadian Farms, however, which is the, one of the biggest producers of this, was, was bought out recently by a big company that has nothing to do with organics whatsoever and has really compromised the integrity of organics. They are getting away with a lot, and they're not as true of organic foods, the company Cascadian, because they're getting a lot, almost everything overseas. And so it's really poorly monitored. So it's still a step up from Orida or Bird's Eye or, some, or Green Giant, but 
it's not as good as other companies that have frozen? Well, you know, I'm thinking of organic. Organic Consumers has a website, more on what Betsy's yes. talking about. When you want to take it to an, the next level uh, and you realize that you probably don't want packaged foods if you're curious, they have all the companies, like all the companies that Monsanto owns, and you'd be surprised that I would, I'm just, I'm just making this number off off the top of my head, but when I look at the brands on there, I'd say probably at least half, if not a majority of the organic brands at Whole Foods are owned by Philip Morris, Exxon, uh, Monsanto. Monsanto. So you, you know, I think it's organic consumers, but I think if you Google organic consumers, you'll find it. Yeah, if you I, look up organic I consumers, GMO, and that kind of thing, cool. you should find it in there. They also have on their lists of the, the dirty dozen, the worst offenders of chemicals. So if you're looking at how to spend your organic dollar, those, those foods that are highest in pesticides, you want to make sure you have organic, and those that are lowest, you would not necessarily need to buy organic. So there's a lot of good information on that site. Um, one of the other questions is, what about applying uh, diet to lotions, toothpaste, et cetera? Mm, good question. And, and I good think question. that you know our skin is one of the largest organs, so what we put on our skin is absolutely very important. Um, one of my favorite websites, they just redid it, is it's if you Google Skin Deep, if you, if you Google the Environmental Working Group, Skin Deep, they just changed the website name, so I don't remember it off the top of my head, but they have an, a, an enormous database of tens of thousands of products, and you can look up toothpaste, you can look up shampoo, and they might have baby shampoos, and they will list it in order of toxicity and what ingredients are toxic, what ingredients they have research on. It's the most comprehensive uh, website I've ever seen on body care products and those kinds of things for Texas. Just so you know, some really good companies that I do, I have researched a lot and are very, Aubrey is one of the best, A-U-B-R-E-Y. Aubrey is very strict. People say, ah, oh, their products don't work as well. You have, you have to, they don't foam a lot because that's good. That's mm -hmm. sodium lauryl sulfate that makes things foam. So they don't extremely foam, but Aubrey is a very good company. Tropical Traditions is a great company. I love their lotions. They make coconut um, oil-based lotions, and they are very pure in ingredients. Another very, very good company. Some of these companies, you know, are just very trendy, And but if you look inside their, like, things like Tom's of Maine, th their toothpaste is not good at all. I mean, it's just filled with a lot of really bad things inside it. Uh, and even the companies like Kiss My Face, which are wet, readily available at places like Whole Foods, have lots of toxins as well. One of the most toxic soaps that you can buy out there are the ones that they sell at bed, bed and body work, Bath and Body Works. Some of the worst, yeah. the worst toxic chemicals in those products of all. Then, of course, you have the things like the Mr. Bubbles and the Blue's Clues Bubble Bath. Those are the most toxic also, very, very bad. With toothpaste, there are some good companies out there. Um, I, I use... I specifically use um, Young Living, which is a um, essential oil company. I like their toothpaste, but there's a one by Well. It's what? What? Walina. Walina. Can you spell it? Do you? It's W E L E D A. Right. It's a really but good one. But look them up on the the yeah. Skin Deep because I was shocked actually to see some things I thought were really good weren't so good and some things that I thought weren't so great actually were a lot better on the list than I thought. So, so it was Alita okay? Or? It was not as good as I expected it to be. Hmm. You know, so. That's and there was one or two Toms of Maine that are, not all of them, but there were a couple of them that were actually pretty good. So if you don't have access to a lot of these specialty stores, you might be able to find that one product that, right. that you need. Right. I, you know, for toothpaste, honestly, you can make it yourself very, very easily. Um, I, Dr. Alina Garcia is going to be lecturing tomorrow on the Family Health Day. She's, I'm a big fan of hers. And, you know, she's just like, people are just so caught up in the, what's the toothpaste? And it's really just a matter of just wiping off the plaque. It doesn't have to be this big old chemically based reaction that goes inside there. For, for years, I've made my son's toothpaste where I use um, a quarter of a teaspoon of a coarse salt and, excuse me, a quarter, a quarter part of coarse salt to th three, three quarters part of um, baking soda. And then um, if I want to make it sweeter, I'll add some vegetable glycerin, not a non-corn-based vegetable glycerin. And then I have a lot of essential oil, so I'll put a little cinnamon or a little citrus in there. And you can make up your own very, very easily. The glycerin, you just add until you get a nice little paste. And then just put a, maybe a little piece in there. And it, it actually, I think, tastes pretty well. <laughs> and it's cheap.
What is our time? We have about five minutes. Okay, one more question. All right. Canned coconut milk. Canned coconut milk. What about it? So there would be a difference between yes. the SCD and the GFCF and, and different. I do use canned, um, the, I use the whole fat, I don't use the light. And um, I also do make my own using the, um, the SCD method of taking some dried coconut and water and mixing that up. So, but, but I keep those cans on hand because they are certainly convenient. What was the question? The, was the canning process GF? Yes, yes, it is. And then with SCD, there's some other things that they want to make sure you don't introduce. No starches are introduced, so they're a little bit more strict with that. But the other piece of it is aluminum or plastic. So yeah. they all aluminum, all cans are aluminum, and so for that reason, it's not great. And then when they don't use aluminum, they have aluminum, and then line it with plastic which to me is just as bad, if not worse. So, <laughs> but there are companies, I think it's Wilderness Family Wilder Farms yes. makes a glass jar of coconut milk. And I don't know for a specific carbohydrate diet right now uh, if, if that's compatible or not, but that's a nice non-toxic. non, non uh, toxic And, and canning. Tropical Traditions makes a coconut cream concentrate that is also in a glass bottle, and then you can take a spoonful of it and, and add it to water to make your own coconut milk. Mm -hmm. I use them both for baking. Do you know about rice milk? It does have lucinates more readily available. Yeah, Pacific. 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 Like a brand? Like the ocean. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't think so, but you can make your own. You can make your own. Pacific brand. Pacific yep. rice milk, right. Trader Joe's brand as well, which I think Pacific private labels for them. And I think, I think Trader Joe's also carries Pacific. We should save these. For, yeah, we'll save them. Oh, uh, okay, yes. We're done with these two. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say one more. I, I am, I'm trying to remember how much I put in there. Uh, I think I talk a little bit about it. But I can always incorporate more things as I go, which I usually do. I can't remember off the top of my head uh, how much of the toxic stuff I have in there. <laughs> I just want to say one more question before we all go and have our lunch. Is one, of the, one of the questions is, my son likes to dip his food in ketchup or mustard. Do you have any recipes for dipping? And I have lots of recipes for dipping, because I think that's universal for kids. They like interactive food. I mean, put it on a skewer, put it in a little cup, give them something to dip it in, and they're going to eat things that they normally might say, ooh, I don't like that. And, and um, actually, in the restaurant here, the benchmark is serving specials that are GFCF, and they're, they're all from my cookbook. And um, I don't know how, they've, how well they've done. I'm sure they've done a good job. <laughs> but, but I have a, a chicken nugget recipe with an apricot dipping sauce that is, um, that's really good. And so... There, there are a lot of ones. I have one that I make with pumpkin. Um, I think it's important to have something that tastes good that they can dip it in. And you would ask ketchup and mustard. Um, I, I use, I don't know how you ladies feel about this, I use West Spray ketchup. Um, again, ketchup is tomato, and if you're avoiding nightshades, you're going to avoid ketchup altogether. Or but, phenols. Right, or, or phenols. phenols. Right. Thank you. But, um, Thank you. but yeah. West Spray makes one that's fruit juice sweetened, that is low, low in sugar. They actually make a totally sugar-free one, but they also make a fruit juice sweetened one that's low in sugar, very low in sodium, and really tastes good. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Oh, sorry. The, the cross-contamination question is an important one, and it, I think everybody here would probably have a different answer, especially S Susan, who's celiac or deals with, with gluten intolerance. It's going to be a lot stricter to her than if you're dealing with just the peptide issue. So I don't know on the SCD end, but I, I personally am not a fanatic about cross-contamination. Of course, I do not want to give my child a trace amount of anything, but I also want to be able to 
live as much as I possibly can. And, um, you know, that's, but that's where it goes back to the more you cook yourself, the more you know of what's happening. In there. And one of the questions earlier was on enzymes and the use of enzymes. We can probably talk more later, but just yeah, we'll talk about it later. enzymes are really good for that little cross-contamination piece, so you don't have to be so crazy about every little thing. That's a nice little way to, you know, catch the extras. We could talk about that later. Okay. Yeah, we well, can. And the other, I just want to add to the cross-contamination. You, if you have an anaphylactic allergy to any ingredient, you're not going to want to eat something that says made in a facility that also produces. But for me, as a celiac, I obviously don't want any gluten, but I'm not concerned if it's made in a facility that makes wheat and, and other things. If I did have that anaphylactic allergy, I think I would be a lot more concerned about that. But, it, you know, and then, again, if it's a peptide issue, you could be even a less less Well, concerned. some celiacs do have to be very, con I mean, they're really, really, really sensitive. Right. But there's different degrees of everything. So, yeah. Yeah. So we have some. All right. Okay. Well, so one hour, 1.30, come back, and we will start again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.